China is one of the most important economies in the world, not only because of its sheer size, but also because of the influence it has over its region, the way it conducts business with other economies around the world, its immense currency reserves, problematic foreign policies, and of course, its population that represents a fifth of all people living in the world. Even if China wasn't the second largest economy in the world, it would still get a lot of attention for how much of a tangible impact it has on our everyday lives. Look around you right now and I'm sure there are dozens of items that were made in Chinese factories that are materially improving your standard of living, probably including the device that you're watching this video on right now. The economic dependency that we may or may not like to admit that we have on China is starting to wane, but it's still there and that's why the validity and reliability of their economic data is something that has a very real impact on the way that we manage our own economies. Anytime I've made a video that looks at the economy of China on this channel, I normally give a brief disclaimer that economic figures from Chinese agencies are potentially altered by different levels of government to present a more positive image of Chinese economic prosperity. This could include anything from inflating output figures to misrepresenting employment data. There are very logical reasons that different levels of government within China would try to do this, whether it be more funding for local projects, gaining favour with party leaders for delivering good results, and on an international level presenting a strong face to potential allies and adversaries alike. Misrepresenting economic figures can do a lot more harm than bruising a few egos and allocating credit where it's not really due it can seriously impact the quality of life of, in China's case, billions of people. Beyond that, I think it's also important to recognise that misrepresenting economic statistics is not a problem unique to China by any means. But it is the second largest economy in the world and it does have the reputation more than any other country for this practice, so it makes a great case study to learn what to look for to see if any other economy is doing the same thing. So, what evidence is there to suggest that China is misrepresenting their economic figures? What problems do these figures cause in the real economy? And finally, what metrics can we look at to determine the true prosperity of an economy if the official figures are unreliable? After we've done all of that, and just for fun, we can put China on the Economics Explained National Leaderboard using figures that were collected independently of official outlets to see how it stacks up against its current position. This episode of Economics Explained was brought to you by Morning Brew. Morning Brew is a service that sends you an email every morning with a selection of high quality articles on a diverse range of topics. It's kind of like having an assistant comb through the biggest and most interesting articles of the day and giving you a condensed version of the stories that you can read in less than 10 minutes. One that I found particularly interesting is how Miami nightclubs are now struggling for business because the crypto millionaires that used to frequent these establishments have lost a lot of their money and can no longer afford to ball out. It was a great demonstration of how every change in an economy changes at least five other things, and it's certainly a story that I wouldn't have read if it wasn't for Morning Brew. The best part is, unlike having an assistant, Morning Brew is completely free, so there's no risk in giving it a try by signing up at the link in the description below. When assessing information, every type of scientist, including social scientists like economists, must consider the accuracy, precision and relevance of the data and information that they are working with. The classic way this is explained is by imagining a dartboard. If points of data are accurate and precise, they will be grouped around the bullseye very tightly. If the data is precise but not accurate, they will still be tightly grouped, but they will be in one corner of the board. And if the data is accurate but not precise, they will be grouped around the bullseye with a lot of spacing in between each shot. The relevance of data can be a little bit harder to determine, but to stretch this example, if you were actually playing a game of golf, the grouping of your darts on a dartboard is kind of meaningless. I actually don't like this example because it's very easy to confuse accuracy with precision, so let's use an example that actual economists might work with in the real world. Consider the GDP of a country like Australia. The World Bank estimates that in 2021 Australia's output was $1,542,660,000,000. That figure is precise down to the closest million dollars, but its accuracy might not be that great because the IMF says that Australia's total output was $1,724,787,000,000 and the United Nations says it was $1,423,473,000,000. These estimates can't all be accurate. There is a variance of more than $300 billion here, which is roughly the economy of Portugal. The reason for this is that all of these organisations use very different techniques to collect and process the data needed to estimate GDP figures, which goes to show that there is a lot of wiggle room to interpret information like this even when dealing with a very transparent and reliable country like Australia. What's more is that these figures actually make another mistake that economists should look out for. 
They have oversold their precision. There is no way that an organisation would be able to measure the total output of any national economy down to the closest $1 million. Yet, they have expressed their figures down to this point, which could give the reader the wrong impression of how precise these figures really are. Economists actually make mistakes like this all the time, and people making big decisions based off this data definitely know that it's not precise down to the nearest million dollars, but if you are making calculations like this yourself, make sure to round it to the factor of 10 that you can be confident of, and you can say that you're making better economic figures than the UN. Now, the relevancy of Australia's GDP figures depends on what you are trying to achieve. If you want a snapshot of the general size of the Australian economy, yeah, GDP figures are great for that. But if you want to understand living standards in Australia or the size of the German economy, well then these figures are not really relevant at all. At least not without additional information. Now apart from tricking you into learning something about statistics, it's really important to understand the accuracy, precision and relevance of any figures you see, because even if they're not outright cooking their books, there is a chance that they can be carefully selected to give you the wrong impression. If the people collecting and processing this data have no specific bias, then small errors like this can balance themselves out especially if data points are collected broadly and in large numbers. But in China, there is a very real incentive for all levels of government to pick figures that present a more positive image. If those points of bias data get passed up the ranks to be aggregated into national figures, the errors can compound on one another to produce net results that are off in a very big way. Beyond that, collecting GDP data is hard. I think it's worth recognising that the World Bank tracks the ability of all countries to produce accurate economic figures using the Statistical Capacity Score. In the past, China's score has been below the median. It scored in the 38th percentile of low and middle income countries in 2004 and the 52nd percentile in 2015. However, in the 2016 rankings, China was placed in the 83rd percentile, meaning only 17% of low and middle income countries were able to produce more accurate aggregate figures than it was. That's still not great because low and middle income countries tend to produce much worse economic figures than advanced countries, but it does make sense that poorer countries have a harder time producing high quality economic data. The actual formula for economic output is quite easy. Consumption plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. No problems there. But if I gave you all of the resources at the disposal of an average national statistics bureau, where would you start on working out the actual numbers to plug into this equation? It's theoretically possible to sit an economist at the end of every production line and service being provided in the country, but that's obviously wildly impractical. Because, well, at that point, a significant portion of your economic output would be measuring your economic output. In advanced economies with very formalised financial systems, the government agencies in charge of producing economic figures can use data collected by other agencies to track things that they might be interested in. The US Bureau of Economic Analysis is responsible for producing the GDP estimates for all the American states, as well as the US as a whole, and they mostly use data collected from the IRS and customs. You should be able to look up the methodology that your own government uses to produce economic estimates, as most of them want to make the process as transparent as possible. The problem this creates for a country like China is that a large portion of its economy is still very informal. We have already explored in a recent video that only around 2% of China's population actually pays regular taxes, so getting a clear economic picture using tax records just isn't feasible. This means that they have no other option than to rely on more first-hand data collection. We also have to address the elephant in the room. Corruption in China. It's been known to happen. So when a massive economy like China is dealing with a very complex set of figures that have been collected and interpreted by many layers of government employees, all with a vested interest in presenting a positive message to their superiors, it's no wonder that the figures become unreliable. We also have to consider the compounding effect of figures that are reported every year. Carsten Holes is a researcher at Stanford University that published a paper on the quality of China's GDP statistics called the quality of China's GDP statistics. It's an old paper now, but it argued that after fabricating one report, leaders struggled to go back to accurate numbers because they would have to report lower than actual growth to rebalance the level of output. If you are a local government leader that has accidentally or willfully overestimated their output figures by 1% in a year, you're going to need to add an extra 1% to next year's figures or else it's going to make it look like you've gone backwards. Do this for long enough and the gap between the correct figures and last year's figures will be so large that reporting correct figures would cause such a drastic drop that it would spark an investigation. At that point, even if the officials didn't want to blatantly report false figures, it would be in their best interest to keep doing it because the punishment would likely be severe. Now this is the important part. The Chinese government recognised this problem as early as the 1990s. 
Famously, a leaked comment by a top Chinese government official openly admitted that GDP figures were purely man-made. Because of this systemic problem, international organisations and even the Chinese government itself no longer uses data collected by provincial governments to create national output figures without first making corrections to account for the trend of overinflated figures. The problem then is that the National Bureau of Statistics of China is freely admitting to making discretionary adjustments to its data and providing no further transparency on what those adjustments are. The research division of the American Federal Reserve has argued that this lack of transparency is actually worse than the blatantly false figures because it's harder to know what those adjustments were. So it's fairly obvious to most economists that yes, through a combination of data collection difficulties, incompetence, corruption and willful manipulation that yes, Chinese economic figures are unreliable and they are overestimated rather than underestimated. So the next question is, how do we make better estimates? The output of an economy is highly correlated with a lot of other data points that can be observed without the help or more importantly the interference of government organisations. Li Kai-chang, the Communist Party official who admitted that their GDP figures were man-made, very candidly discussed that the only three things he looked at to evaluate the economy was electricity consumption, rail cargo volume and bank lending. If an economy is using more electricity, moving more cargo via rail and lending more money to various projects, it's almost certainly creating more output. The benefit of using these data points is that they are centralised, so they're easy to gather, and they're also very hard to manipulate. Electricity consumption is measured directly from the grid, rail yards need to keep track of containers coming and going, and banks obviously want to make sure that they're keeping reliable records of who owes them money. Now this is great stuff. If you are a high ranking official from the CCP, a foreign economist isn't going to have much luck asking a Chinese state owned bank for a comprehensive breakdown of their new domestic lending activities. This means that these figures are still prone to being manipulated before anybody outside the party gets to see them. But there are other sources of data that are admittedly worse, but are much easier to collect. One popular method is to measure the light emitted from a country at night using satellite imagery. The theory is that a country will emit more light when it has more economic activity happening. Road lights, factory lights, car lights, even stadium lights are all direct results of some type of economic output. So the more light, the higher the GDP. This is a really fun theory because we can roughly test it by looking at different imagery. This is South Korea with a GDP of $1.8 trillion and then this is North Korea with a GDP of roughly $29 billion. Now while this is a fun theory, I'm sure a lot of you are already thinking of problems with this system. For example, there are many other factors that determine light output aside from pure economic activity. A country with a larger population will naturally use more lights. A country with more heavy industry will use more light when compared to a country that mostly produces value in the service sector. Even cultural differences around how bright residents want their cities to be can change light output. For example, compare Shanghai to Paris. One is much more lit up than the other, but Paris is actually the larger economic centre. Of course, you can add balances for these factors, but then you run into the same problem of changing outputs based on some level of discretion. Louis Martinez, an economist at the University of Chicago, published a paper on this theory that suggested that the growth in China's light output over previous decades was not sufficient to be in line with their claimed growth in overall economic output. He also found that autocratic governments in general tend to overstate their actual economic figures by an average of 35% when measured using light output as an indicator of growth. The same paper went on to argue that China's growth may have been overestimated by more than double in the years between 1993 and 2012. Martinez did account for the differences in the countries he studied in a way that has held up to widespread peer review. But don't get too excited because that just means that he drew rational conclusions from reliable data. Autocracies, especially those with a communist focus, tend to put a heavy emphasis on heavy industry even when they are very poor. This means that their baseline light output would already be very high and the change in total light output wouldn't be as heavily affected by households growing wealthier as it would in a typical economy that takes the standard route of going from agrarian farmers to factory labourers to service sector workers. Lenin himself famously said in one of his speeches that communism is Soviet power plus the electrification of the whole country. So communist nations obviously have a propensity to supply electricity as a priority. You could think of this like trying to work out how rich your neighbours are by how many times they have food delivered to them every month. The general theory is, is that as people earn more money they can afford more restaurant food to be delivered to them. But if you just happen to live next door to neighbours that are total foodies, then they might order restaurant meals every night already. If they get a big promotion at work, they aren't going to order any more food because there's only so much you can eat in a day. 
But if you're basing your estimate of how much their income has grown off how much extra food they are ordering, you're unlikely to pick up on the fact that they did get that promotion. Martinez did recognise this problem, and he wasn't seriously advocating for the idea that international organisations should use telescopes instead of government supplied figures, but he did offer it up as a surprisingly viable verification check. Now, just quickly, I want to mention that Money and Macro, a smaller economics channel, beat me to the punch once again on this particular paper when he made quite a detailed video on the methodology of this research. We covered different details, but he definitely deserves another shout out. Now, the important part here is that all of these alternative ways to measure GDP growth can be used to verify or raise doubts over different figures, but they struggle to come up with accurate estimates themselves. For the most part, that's actually good enough. To actual decision makers and even the economies themselves, GDP figures don't matter nearly as much as you might think they do. GDP growth is so highly coveted because it can directly lead to improvements in living standards for average people in the economy. So GDP growth pays over a lot of other problems. People are willing to put up with a lot if they think they're getting richer. Of course, we know that GDP figures are just the ones that get the headlines, and it's definitely possible for living standards and economic influence to decrease even when output is increasing. If you need to see this counterintuitive trend in action, well, look no further than China. Okay, now just for fun, I wanted to try something out. I took the estimates from the various research papers and reports that we explored in this video and used them to re-evaluate China's position on the Economics Explained National Leaderboard. So starting with size, most of the papers don't actually take the bold step of proposing their own GDP estimates for China's national economy, but just provide guidance on how much the official figures were overestimated. We can still work backwards from this though and find that even the most damning estimates give it a national output of around $9 trillion as compared with the official estimates of $17.7 trillion. This still makes it the second largest economy in the world, so it still gets a 10 out of 10. GDP per capita is the interesting one here because it's really the reason that the Chinese government would feel compelled to lie about these figures in the first place. A large part of what has allowed their authoritarian antics to continue is the idea that people are foregoing certain freedoms, but in exchange they are getting a ticket aboard the fastest growing economy in the world. If the headline figures were more in line with the mediocre estimates of the papers that we've looked at in this video, the people might not see this as a very good trade anymore. According to official figures, China has a GDP per capita of just over $10,000. But if we apply the recommended adjustments, that could be as low as $4,500. That would push a large part of the nation back under the international poverty line, so it gets a 3 out of 10. Stability and confidence is mostly based on non-output factors like political stability, fair legal systems, militaristic ambitions and dependence on single industries. This would remain unchanged at 6 out of 10. Growth is the mechanism by which these figures have arguably become so divorced from reality. If you lie about growth figures one year, you need to keep on lying about them, and a few decades down the track, the nation finds itself in a position where some economists are estimating that their output is overstated by as much as double. The sad part is that China doesn't need to lie about these figures. They would be impressive either way. Even when taking the most conservative estimates, their growth score goes from a 10 out of 10 to an 8 out of 10. Industry is also unchanged because one thing that all economists can agree on is that China's capacity for manufacturing, construction and even service-based industries is only surpassed by the USA on a global scale. So yeah, it still gets a 10 out of 10. Altogether, that gives China an adjusted score of 7.4 out of 10, which is still incredibly impressive, as is the economy of China itself. It's also not the score I'm going to use going forward. Even if a lot of very smart people have made some very compelling arguments that these figures might be more accurate than the official figures, it would hurt the precision of this leaderboard because, well, we've used World Bank estimates for every country, and there are plenty on this list that probably tweak their figures even more than China does. But they get away with it because they don't attract as much attention or interest as the second largest economy in the world. Hi guys, one last thing before I go. I know that a lot of you prefer to listen to these videos, so I want to let you know that the entire EE library is up on Spotify, so you can listen to it on the go without ads. Thanks for watching, mate. Bye.